Hey, g'day, it's Presso. Thanks for stopping by. Now this is the final episode of this four facet drill grinder build. And in today's episode, I want to do the final step, which is calibrating the elevation of the trunnion on this machine. And also I want to demonstrate how long it actually takes to grind a drill bit from scratch. Now I'm still going to do all of that, but there's been a complication and I want you to come in a bit closer. I'll explain what went wrong. Before I talk about the embarrassing stuff, I just want to talk about a couple of upgrades that happened since the last episode that I did on the drill grinder finishing. Now these little end caps here, these have been 3D printed and this came from a suggestion by a viewer named Tony Ray. Now Tony noticed that I hadn't bothered to cover in the end of this V-slot extrusion. So I've done that now. They're 3D printed caps, one on either end. So thanks Tony, uh, it looks a million dollars now. <laughs> And the other thing I've done is I remade the clip which holds this accessory. So when we saw it last time, it was a bit flimsy, didn't really hold it very securely. So those little uh, clips now are three millimeters thick instead of two, and I've closed up the angle slightly. So that now sits there quite securely and it's not gonna fall out. Today's video is gonna be about uh, calibrating this little eccentric here. Now this is what elevates the trunnion to give you the different clearance angles on a drill bit, the primary clearance that is. And the idea is that as you rotate the eccentric, it elevates the trunnion. And what I had done was to laser cut these little templates here, and they were gonna go underneath the trunnion plate. This one's 14 degrees. Then you rotate the eccentric around till it stops moving mark that position with a pencil and then I was going to scan that part and from the scan I could create a CAD model and from the CAD model I can create a cut file and then we could engrave the surface of that disc there using a CNC drag engraving tool. Now it was all going really well I got up to uh, I think 18 degrees and completely ran out of elevation with this eccentric so I'll show you what I mean. I'll take that one out rotate that around as far as it will go and then that only gives me 18 degrees I can't get the the other elevations that I need which need to go up to 24. Now it was a case of going into panic mode I went upstairs I read through John Moran's notes that uh, I based this design on and he had said that this eccentric here should be an inch and a half in diameter or roughly 38 millimeters this one here is nowhere near that and I think what happened was I just made a mock-up of this part one night, probably late at night, <laughs> stuck it in the CAD model and intended to go back and check it and uh, you know check the operation of it and then fix that in the design. And somehow or other, I just didn't do that. So this snuck through. And the thing was that when I started using the machine to sharpen drill bits, I was only using primary clearance angles of 12 and 14 degrees, so it worked fine. But when you get down to the smaller diameter drill bits, you need to elevate it more than that. So I've made a new eccentric, and we're gonna look at that in a minute, but that also created a problem with this little uh, flip plate around the side here, which gives you the secondary clearance. And I also found a problem with this part here. Now, the thing is, I've already published the drawings, or I had already published the drawings, and I'm guessing that a lot of people have downloaded those in the first couple of days after I published the last video. If you did that, please go back and check again and download the latest version because I've fixed the drawings and the latest version should be correct. Let's have a close look at this part and what I've done. So here are three parts that have just come off the machine. This is the eccentric wheel that you should be able to rotate to give you all of these uh, primary clearance angles that you need. This is the bracket that is screwed to the bottom of the trunnion and it allows the eccentric to rotate on that uh, tapped hole there. And this is the little sector plate that can drop down to give you the secondary clearance angle of 25 degrees. So this one is incorrect. Here's the correct one here. And you can see that this one is quite a lot bigger in diameter. It's also thicker. Uh, it's about six millimeters thick. And it also has a curved edge on it with a six millimeter radius. And the reason you need that is that as you rotate the eccentric, the contact point moves across the face of the wheel. Now this one here had a square edge and as you rotate it, the contact point shifts from either the front edge or the back edge so you don't sort of get a smooth transition. In reality it doesn't really matter that much but uh, John Moran's notes said that you should have a radius so that's what I've done. Now on the back of this one you'll notice that the boss is actually centered on the wheel itself. On this one here the boss is centered on the uh, pivot hole. 
So on the 2D drawings on my Dropbox, this part is now fully detailed and it is correct and it does work. So this is the one you need to make, not that one there. So I'll put this one aside and uh, what we're going to do today is to try and work out how we can engrave the marks on this so that we can use all of the primary clearance angles from 12 degrees up to 24 degrees. So uh, we don't have to do them all. Uh, it goes 12, 14, 16, 18, 21, 24. So that's what we're going to do, uh, but I need to talk about this part. Now when I took this part off my machine, it was working fine, there's no problem with it, but when I checked the drawing in my CAD model, this was incorrect. Now I don't know what went wrong, but this included angle up in this corner here should be 65 degrees. The CAD model that I'd done had an included angle of 75 degrees. Now again, can't account for why that happened. I do know that Autodesk Inventor does this weird thing where it can make some parts adaptive. And what that means is that if you alter the geometry of one part, it can influence the geometry of another part. And if you don't catch it, if you're not aware it's happening, it can alter a part and you go ahead and publish it, you think it's correct. Uh, and if you don't actually physically make the parts or make a model, uh, like a physical model, you may not realize that there's been a problem. But when I changed the CAD model to give us that 65 included angle, it also had an effect on the radius of that little sector plate there. Now, not by much, it was only like a couple of fractions of a millimeter, but I've made it correct. It should give you a true angle of 25 degrees when you drop this sector plate down onto the carriage. So again, uh, these are the parts that uh, you need to ensure are correct. And if you've got the latest version of the drawings, that will happen. So what I've done here is I've put some masking tape on the face of that eccentric and it's all screwed back in place there now. And what you can do is to mark directly onto the masking tape a line that would be vertical when you have the correct elevation on the trunnion. So in order to set the first angle, what I made with these little uh, templates, uh, this one here is 12 degrees included angle, top to bottom, and you can rotate the eccentric up out of the way, put that template underneath the trunnion, and then just get everything set. So it's sort of resting on that template there now. And the idea would be that you rotate the eccentric down until it's touching the carriage. And I've marked a bit of a pencil line on this bit of tape on the carriage here, but in reality, the contact point shifts in an elliptical orbit as you rotate the eccentric. So there's really no point in actually putting like a, a zero marker on the carriage because the contact point will shift left and right. It might be okay, I'll give you a sort of rough guide though. So the idea would be then that we need to mark a vertical line on the face of the eccentric. Now I've made a little laser cut uh, square, I guess you could call it. And uh, that uh, piece of material there fits up against the edge of the eccentric wheel. And then we can scribe the line on this longer edge here. The cutout at the bottom there is to clear a nut, like a nylock nut, which holds one of the wheels on. So what we can do is put that in there and slide it across until it's against the edge of the eccentric wheel. And then with a nice sharp pencil, just mark that line. Now, this is really awkward with the camera in the way. <laughs> um, I'll do my best here. All right, so we can mark that off there. And that mark there now is our 12 degree mark. And what you do is just repeat that process. So you elevate the trunnion to 14 degrees, do the same again, and continue up until you've got all of the marks on this quadrant of the wheel here. Now the wheel can rotate around to the right as well. And that's actually a good thing because then you can have alternate marks on both sides of the eccentric. These end up being very close together and engraving the numbers is going to be a bit of a problem. So what I'll do is mark both sides and then we can just skip from one side to the other as we go from 12 to 14 degrees on this side, 16 degrees on this side, 18 degrees on that side and so on. Now if you've got one of these little digital angle gauges, these are even better than using templates that I've got there. So you can put, place that on the trunnion 
I've already zeroed that against the carriage and then I can just look directly at the digital display as I lift it. So let's do a couple more and then we'll, uh, we'll have a look and see what that looks like. So I'm going to come up to 14 degrees. That's it there. So you can see what I mean about those lines being very close together. Okay, let's do 16. And 18. And so on. Now I'm going to do this again. Um, I know it's not correct because like I say, it's, I can't get my head around to see what I'm doing and the camera's in the way. So I'm going to do all of this again and I'll show you what it looks like with the marks on both sides and then we'll go from there. Well there's all the divisions on there now and they should be symmetrical around this point here, directly underneath that screw. And I know they're not perfect and at the end of the day it doesn't really matter that much. When you're grinding the primary clearance on the end of a drill bit, the exact angle is not as important as having both cutting edges identical. So if you were trying to grind a primary clearance at say 14 degrees and it worked out at 14.5 or 13.9, it doesn't really matter as long as both cutting edges are symmetrical. And that's what this machine does really well. And if you had no other way of doing it, the next step would be to just simply scribe through that masking tape with a very sharp scriber and a straight edge. And you could then stamp the numbers on for each of the divisions that you need. And the idea, like I said before, would be to skip from one side to the other. So there's 12 degrees, the next one would be 14, then we'd go to 16 and so on. And that way you've got a bit more space between the lines to work with. Now, my plan was to take this and put it on my flatbed scanner and create a JPEG image of that face there and then import that JPEG into a program like CorelDRAW or Inkscape, which are vector drawing programs. We would then try to vectorize all of those marks. We could put the digits on and we could take that uh, and export that as a DXF image. And then if you've got a CNC engraver, CNC router, CNC milling machine or even a laser engraver, you could easily engrave those marks on that material. And I'd gone through that process, I started doing it and uh, it sort of got a bit clumsy. Uh, you're dealing with like a fuzzy JPEG image and you're trying to get nice crisp lines out of it. And I thought, you know what, it's got to be a better way. I should be able to do this directly from the CAD model. So I played around with that and I've got that to work. So I want to show you how that works on the screen and then we'll actually do the engraving. So here is the scanned image that I did and you'll notice it looks a bit different to the one I just showed you. Uh, it's because I did it earlier and I scanned that at about 600 dpi but remember what you end up with is a JPEG image, a bitmap image and that's no good for doing any sort of CNC work. You need to turn that into a vector image and export that as a DXF. And CorelDRAW does that, so I've imported the JPEG image into CorelDRAW and I started drawing guidelines over the top of all those angular lines. Uh, it was a bit tedious uh, because you've got no points you can snap to, there's no way of getting absolutely precise uh, endpoints for any of those lines, you've just got to guess it. Once I got that, I was able to draw some solid lines and create those at the correct length, put the digits on, and I had it pretty much finished and I was ready to go ahead and engrave it. And I thought, you know what, it's probably not accurate. There's probably minor differences between the angles on both sides. And I figured that there's got to be a way of doing it from the CAD program that I already had. So what I'm going to do is to have a go at actually putting the lines on directly on the CAD part in Autodesk Inventor. And then we'll try and create a PDF file of that, import that back into CorelDRAW and turn it into something that we can export to my CNC milling machine. So here we are in Autodesk Inventor and rather than work on the full assembly of the drill grinder I've made up a simplified assembly. So what we end up with is the carriage plate, the trunnion plate, the pivot on one side, the eccentric bracket and the eccentric. Now all of that's been constrained and I can lift and lower the trunnion and you'll notice that as I do that the eccentric wheel turns with it. What you do next is you put an angular constraint between the carriage and the trunnion and you can set that angle to whatever you want. So we're going to start at say 12 degrees and what we do then is we create a sketch 
on the front face of the eccentric wheel. Now once you're in that sketch mode you can then create a perpendicular line from the center of the eccentric to the carriage. That perpendicular line can then be locked in place. So I'm actually locking that to the sketch of the eccentric itself. So that when we rotate around to the next angle, which is say 14 degrees, the sketch that I've just done will rotate with the eccentric wheel. And what we do next is we just simply repeat that process for all of the angles on both sides of the eccentric. Now it's a bit tedious, it's just rinse and repeat, but once you get into the groove, it doesn't take too long. Now when we go into the drawing environment in Inventor, none of those sketches will show up uh, because they weren't turned into features. But what you can do with Inventor is you can pick a sketch and turn it into what they call a mark. So a mark would be something that you create with a laser engraver or a plasma cutter or something like that. Now as soon as you turn it into a mark, it appears in the drawing environment. And what I have then is a, an A4 sheet with our marked out eccentric wheel on it. I can then export that as a PDF file. So here we are in Corel Draw now. We've got our PDF on the screen and we're gonna go around now. We're gonna edit that PDF and get rid of all the stuff that we don't need. We're gonna cut down the lines to make them shorter. And then we're gonna put the numbers on for each of the increments that we want. I'll delete every second one on left and right side. So we've got a little bit more space to play with to get those numbers in there. So here is the finished file. And what we can do now is take this down and we're gonna set up the part on the CNC milling machine. And we're gonna drag engrave all of those marks on that eccentric wheel. I'm gonna machine up a little fixture to press our eccentric into. This is just some of that plastic composite decking material. And uh, the good thing about CNC drag engraving is that there's not a lot of tool pressure involved. You don't really need to clamp things down with toe clamps or anything like that. Sometimes just hot glue or double-sided tape will do. going to take all the burrs off this and we just push the part in uh, this big hole in the center so I can push the part out from the other side if it gets stuck and this is just a clearance hole for the boss on the back of the eccentric. Well in theory this part should just tap into that fixture. You sort of got to align the boss underneath that hole there. So we'll get the drag engraving tool set up and we'll run that program. So here's my drag engraving tool. Now this has a 90 degree carbide scriber. It's held in place by a magnet and also there's a spring on top of that scriber. So as the spindle lowers down to zero Z, it'll go another two and a half millimeters, but the scriber will compress the spring and it will just simply scratch a mark in this material. Now the spindle doesn't rotate and uh, one of the good things about this process is that if that surface is not dead level, it's still going to produce a mark and it's going to be consistent because of the spring pressure on the scriber. Okay, let's see what happens. This is a one-shot deal. If I screw this up, <laughs> I'm going to start again. Okay, that looks all right. We're just going to run it, uh, run the whole program now. Oh, 
one of the things about this process you hear every creak and groan in your uh, motors and your drive system uh, doesn't sound good <laughs> Alrighty, so you do get a few little burrs on the surface but on anodized material they tend to just sort of rub off fairly easily. Okay, I'm going to pop that out and we'll put it on the machine and see how it looks. Alright, get this guy on and we'll sharpen some drill bits. So there's the eccentric back on the machine and it's set to 21 degrees and if we come up here and have a look at the digital angle gauge it's now 20.9 was 21 a minute ago <laughs> and it's a bit of a subjective thing you know you sort of turn that wheel and trying to estimate that that line is truly vertical to the carriage but it's to get you in the ballpark if you're within 0.2 or 0.3 of a degree i think it's good so what we'll do now is we'll sharpen a drill bit and we're going to time it from start to finish. All right, to do this uh, timed drill grinding test, I've got two subjects here. This one here is a, an 11.30 seconds and that's roughly 8.7 millimetres. This is a 3.30 seconds or roughly 2.4 millimetres. Now I've chosen this, uh, this bigger diameter drill bit here because it's pretty knackered on the end there. Uh, one corner is chipped, uh, the grind looks like it's been done offhand on a bench grinder, probably one I did really badly. And this one's going to take a fair bit of work to get back into a good cutting condition. The smaller diameter one here is pretty good, uh, it just needs a touch up and it needs to have the four facet grind rather than the, the regular commercial grind on it. So what I've got is my phone set up over there, I'll get a stopwatch running on that. Alright, so start the clock now. So we're just going to put our drill bit into the collet and get the collet sort of hand tight so the drill bit can still move. Alright, now we're going to go over to the bench vise and tighten this up. Now we're just going to set the stick out on the drill bit to 9mm. Okay, now we need to set the cutting edges so they're level. So I'm going to lock the collet chuck and then make sure that the eccentrics turned all the way around onto the stop pin and lock that. Alrighty, let's grind.
I just stopped the stopwatch because that has the four facet grind on it now, but I found that it still needs to have the heel of the drill bit ground off slightly. So even though I remade the eccentric on the front of the machine and also the little uh, latch plate that gives you the secondary clearance angle, even at 25 degrees that heel is still rubbing. So what I'll do is take this over to the bench grinder and I'll just knock the corner off on the grinder uh, freehand and that drill bit will be finished. So we were at, um, what were we? Yeah, 4 minutes 34 seconds and uh, I'll just start the clock again while I go over and just uh, fix up that corner. Alright, made a bit of a mess of that. <laughs> Had to have about three goes at it, but that's given me the clearance on the heel now and that drill bit will cut, it's, it'll be fine. So um, I'm still learning, uh, I'm still getting into a sort of a pattern and a sort of a workflow. Uh, I've only really ground about uh, like half a dozen drill bits since I put the machine back together again. But uh, let's do the smaller one and just see how that turns out. Okay, I'm going to try and sharpen this little 332nd drill bit. I've got two cameras set up so I don't need to reposition the camera. I'm going to start the stopwatch and uh, we'll just do it from start to the end of the four facet grind and see how long that takes. Now I've got my magnifier set up here because this is the hardest part is actually being able to see the rotational alignment of the drill bit in the collet. But I'll give it my best shot. Alright, starting the clock now. Okay, uh, I think that's done. So that was uh, like 2 minutes and 30 seconds. And the small drill bits are really quick because they don't need a lot of grinding. And uh, I guess the other thing we need to do here is just to back off the, the heel of the drill bit. Now I would do that on the split point accessory. That adds about another minute to 2 minutes to the process. But certainly this one here was a lot quicker than the bigger drill bit that we did. But I guess we need to check it now and see if it actually drills holes. <laughs> so I'm going to set up a test. We'll do both the drill bits that we've sharpened and just see how they perform in aluminium and steel. But before I go over there, I'll just knock the heel off this one here.
All right, here's the 330 seconds drill bit. We'll do this first in aluminium. Okay, here it is in steel. Okay, let's try the 11.30 seconds in aluminium. Right, here it is in steel. Well, there's a hole that it formed in steel. It's quite happy with this one. The 330 seconds are a little bit harder to push through than I would like, which might mean that there's not enough clearance on the end of that drill bit. But certainly in steel with this one here, it's quite good. All right, now I need to go back over the bench. We'll talk about the mistakes that were made and how I rectified that and what's happening in the next video. Just before I finish up this afternoon, don't forget to go to my Dropbox and grab the latest version of the drawings, just in case you were an early adopter and got your drawings in the first couple of days. I'll put up on the screen here what those parts look like. Compare them to what you have. If they're the same, you're good. If not, you need to go back and get the latest version. Now I'll also put up the vector drawing of the eccentric wheel, complete with all the markings. So if you want to engrave yours, you can use that vector file and laser engrave or CNC engrave. Okay, let's do the wind up. Well, that's the end of today's video and thank you very much for watching along. So I guess the question now is, am I happy with the build? Well, there are a number of things that I need to improve on with the actual machine. I'll talk about those in a minute. And also I need a lot more practice. Now, so far I've sharpened about a dozen drill bits, various sizes, and the bigger drill bits are fairly straightforward. It's the smaller ones where I need a lot more practice. The biggest difficulty is actually being able to see what you are doing. But I think inherently the machine has the accuracy that I need. It's just a matter of leveraging that and getting more performance out of it. So uh, what are the things that need to be improved? Well, one of them is the dust. Now, I mentioned that I built this new guard here and I hope that that would trap the dust, but it doesn't. It still goes everywhere, as you can see here. I haven't fitted any magnets to the inside of that guard, but that's one way of mitigating that problem. And I'll explore that. The other one is that this 200 grit CBN wheel that I bought is badly out of balance. Now I did actually make a new flange that fits inside the bore of the wheel, hoping that that would center it better, but it's slightly better, but still needs a lot of improvement. So I'm gonna to have to work out ways of trying to balance that wheel. Never done that before, but you know, we can, we can work around that. But certainly it's noisy and there's a lot of vibration, but you know, like I say, I think it can be improved. But at the end of the day, I had a ton of fun building this. And people often question me and they say, oh, why did you go so much trouble doing all the metal finishing and you know, you've overdone this or overdone that. But it's a project and I enjoy making projects. And you know, if it's useful at the end of it, that's great. But if not, you know, if it needs improvement or it doesn't work out, it's given me something to do and I've learned something along the way. And that's, to me, is always the goal. You, you should be learning something new every day. So uh, I'm going to do some more work on this, but uh, we're not going to see any more of it in the near future. Now, what's happening in the next video? Well, I want to work back in the home foundry. I've got a project coming up that uh, needs some aluminium castings. And at the moment, my home foundry is run on propane. I've got a propane burner, but I want to convert that to a diesel burner. So in the next video, I'm going to start that process. 
I've got all the materials and all of the equipment that I need. It's just a matter of getting it started. And uh, I invite you to come along and have a look. Now, success is not guaranteed. <laughs> Could all end in tears, I don't know. But again, it's just a project. And uh, my videos are all about just inviting you to come along and watch over my shoulder as I make stuff. So that's coming up. All right, but for now, thank you very much. And I'll see you next time. It's Prezzo signing out. Cheers.